Good morning. And welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Christian Marquardt. Glad to have the opportunity to worship with all of you here today as we are continuing to celebrate the Sundays after the Epiphany and focusing on our response to our Lord who has appeared to us. Um, all the readings today focus on uh, the idea that after Jesus appeared, he had followers who came with him and he sent them out to be fishers of men. And we'll get to hear about um, a section from the book of Jonah later on this morning. But we're going to get started with our opening hymn. Uh, that is hymn number, I was going to say the old number, because I remember the old red hymnal still. But it's 633, Speak, O Lord. Uh, you'll find the words displayed on the screen, and you can find, follow along with the music um, in the blue hymnal, uh, near the back of the blue hymnal. May God bless our worship this morning. Amen. Our worship continues as we use the service setting one. You'll find that on page 154 in the front of the blue hymnal, the words are also displayed on the screen. Please stand. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your one and only Son to be the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and believed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. 
Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3. This also serves as the text for our sermon later on this morning, so I won't go into everything in that much detail right now. But it's telling that a man who is commanding repentance is a man who has already repented. As this reading starts out, the word of the Lord came to Jonah for a second time. And you and I and many others can all be thankful for God's second chances. A reading from Jonah chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the the destruction he had threatened. The word of the Lord. Our worship continues with the anthem from our choir.
Our second scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5. If you were um, at St. James for any of our worship services during the season of Advent, which is the season that leads up to our celebration of Christmas, then the words from this section will be very familiar because they're words that we used over and over again um, as we had that beginning of, of worship where we, um, we sang O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the first verse, and then we sang another version of it later. And then interspersed are these words that come from this section, recognizing that God is in the business of reaching out to sinners. Not just that, but God has reached out to us and uses us to reach out to others. So these verses will sound familiar, but that's good. This is the business that all of us are in, of seeking to save the lost. A reading from 2 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Our worship continues as we join in singing the gospel acclamation together. If you're following along in the hymnal, please note that we will sing the seasonal verse for Epiphany. Please stand. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Jesus is the light of the world. In him we have the light of life. Alleluia, alleluia, The Gospel reading for the second Sunday after the Epiphany comes from Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. You You may be seated as we continue with our hymn of the day. That's hymn number 743. I hear the Savior calling.
<clears throat> then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed. There is um, a mistake that young men make, at least I know young men make it because I was a young man and I made this mistake, but I suppose probably young women make this mistake and older men and older women. Um, anyone who happens to find an old book on a shelf or find an old video on YouTube or I don't know, whatever, wherever you find old videos, find something in a, a DVD, a VHS, that's right. Some of you still have VHS players that function. Good for you. But the mistake in particular is looking at something from the past, not knowing the context and immediately assuming whatever this person said or did, that's what I ought to be doing. Um, it's nice to have historical perspective on things, but unless you really know the life story of the person and the circumstances leading up to it and what was going on, you won't know why they chose to do what they did, why they said what they did. Um, any young little boy who gets interested in battles and war and being a soldier can find any number of history books that talk about war, World War II, World War I, things even older than that, and can look at the tactics and the things that they did, the way that they sent soldiers in. I remember being a young boy and I was forced to watch um, this documentary about the Civil War. And there's this guy, I can't even think of his name right now, but it's like, it's like 50 VHS tapes long, or at least that's what it felt like. And it just goes on and on, and it's this battle, and the terrible death and suffering of the soldiers, it was gruesome. But it also describes their battle tactics, and one, something that you would try for one battle wouldn't work for the next battle. That's just the way that battles go. And it's, it's the same thing for philosophy and for politics, that something that worked hundreds of years ago doesn't necessarily work today. And it's the same um, for pastors. Where I talked to pastors today and they said, well, I, I read something and it's something from 500 years ago or 1500 years ago. And just because they said it that way doesn't mean you need to say it today. There's this famous sermon from an American preacher, a guy named Jonathan Edwards, and it's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the sermon is what I would call like 99% law. As we talk about law and gospel, law being we find out about our shortcomings and our sin and gospel being hearing about what Jesus does for us. It's like 99% law that this preacher decided, this is what my people need to hear. Um, and in, in American history, it's during the first great awakening. So this is uh, 1741, Jonathan Edwards got up and he preached very vividly about how sinners were hanging by a thread about to fall into the fiery pits of hell. And he just goes on and on. And if the historical record is correct, he, as he's still in the middle of preaching, and, and churches are different. Some churches, people sit very stoically. They don't say anything. Others, people are more vocal. People might even clap or say amen in the middle of the sermon. Apparently, if the historical record is correct, in the middle of this sermon, people start crying out saying, I'm dead. I'm doomed. In the middle of the sermon, people start saying, if the way you're preaching it is correct, I have no hope at all. And some people walked away saying, That's, that must be what God says. Now, it was one pastor's judgment at that point in time that that's the messages people needed to hear. Um, is that right? I suppose, I don't know, I wasn't there. But it would be a mistake for me to find this sermon in a book of sermons, famous sermons, because this is a famous American sermon, American Christian sermon. And for me to take it and say, this famous sermon, my people must need to hear this message. It was a message for a certain group of people at a certain point in time. Um, it's the same thing with, with various things from Lutheran history, from 500 years ago, that at one point the reformers said this thing, and another, their response was very sharp and very strong. Um, do I have to be very sharp and very strong with all the people I interact with? Not necessarily. Um, God makes a man or a woman or a person and gives them a message for a certain period of time. And we have to learn from that 
but sometimes it means we need to adapt it to things that are going on today. Um, some preachers who are facing a lot of pressure from the state, um, certainly preachers in the Middle East and in other places, their message is stronger than mine might be today. But give it 25 years, who knows? What I'm saying is, we want to learn from the past, but it doesn't mean we need to recreate it because our circumstances are different. And here is this guy, Jonah, and he was given a message, but it's different than the message that you and I were given. The point that's the same is the one who's giving it. And the fact that our God gives us second chances. So let's look at this section from the book of Jonah um, and figure out what we can learn and what we can apply to today. Because his message is not the same message that you and I are going to bring. This section starts out, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, and as I already mentioned earlier, that means, let's use our English skills. If the word came a second time, that means that previously the word came a first time. Good job. You figured it out. As I was saying it, you were, I could see the wheels turning in your heads. You figured that out. The word came a first time, and the first time God spoke to Jonah, here's what he said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me, uh, but Jonah ran away. When I was a kid, um, I, all I had was, well, I had a Bible, I had kids' Bibles, and then I had all these kids' movies, because they make all these animated movies of uh, Bible stories for kids to watch. A lot of them were on VHS. There we go. And some of the ones that portrayed Jonah made it seem like Jonah was just a guy in his bed sleeping one day, and then God said, go be a prophet, as though he had never heard of it before. But actually in um, 2 Kings 14, verse 25, it does reference Jonah the prophet, so he was a prophet before, he was probably a prophet after. This is what he was known for. So it's not that far out of the realm of possibility that God would reach out to a prophet and give him a message to proclaim. But what's different is, God says, Jonah, you who live, um, he actually lived in what became the region of Galilee, which is kind of cool. He said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, which is a big city, um, and the historical records are so ridiculous, it's hard for me to believe that it's actually true. Um, I'll explain more about that later, but he's sent to Nineveh, and Nineveh is a city of Israel. No, it's not. It's a city of Assyria, and depending on where you put Jonah in the chronology, the Assyrians would very shortly be attacking the Israelites. Um, it wouldn't even be probably a hundred years later. That's what they would be doing. God says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, go to the great city of Assyria with hundreds of thousands of people living there, go there, Jonah says no and runs away. And in Jonah 1 and 2, we find out Jonah ran away. He uh, seemed to be trying to sail for Spain or as far away from the known world as he could possibly get. God said, go this way. He said no, went away, went on a boat, storm came up, people threw him overboard, was swallowed by a whale or a fish, some giant sea creature. He prayed to God, repented of his sin. The whale spit out Jonah onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, which is pretty cool because if you read the Bible, not everybody gets a second chance, but Jonah does. And I would argue that Jonah is now actually qualified to preach this message because people who believe that God's love is due them by right or by birth or by circumstances are not really qualified to be his prophets. But now as Jonah understands that he personally sinned against God, that he personally repented, and that he found forgiveness, now he's actually ready. And so God calls him to go a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. 
And he did. And he went to the city of Nineveh. And as our description says, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. Now, you might think of different trips you've taken throughout your life or different um, cities that you've gone. And I would say, um, as somebody who's been to New York City briefly, New York City probably requires a visit of more than three days. It's so big, there's so much to do and see if you can afford it. New York is a city that requires more than three days. I would say San Antonio is a city that may be about three days. You've seen all that there is to see. You've walked around the Riverwalk. You've bought stuff at all the little stores, and time to go. Now, that's not exactly what it means. It means a visit required three days. It would take him three days to walk from one end to the other. This is not Jonah stopping in at homes, seeing people, sitting down at their table, spending a long time developing a relationship, getting to know their life story, finding out about their kids, about their grandparents, about different illnesses that they've gone through, where they went to school, where they were educated, where they worked. None of that. He doesn't have time to hardly meet anybody. He's got three days to go through the whole city, and he starts traveling and proclaiming. And this is his message, and I, I would assume it's more words than this, because this is like six words. Forty more days, it's, sorry, it, six words in the Hebrew. There we go. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. Boom. That's the message that God gave him. And he went and he did it. And here's where I say, it's good for us to learn from the past, but this is not necessarily the same message that God gives us. Um, certainly, I'm saying a lot more than six words right now. And God has not called me yet to be Jonah and just walk through the streets of a city saying, go, travel, proclaim this message. You don't have time. We, we don't have time. Forty more days. I got to talk to hundreds of thousands of people. They have to hear this. And it doesn't even take 40 days for them to hear it and repent. That's crazy. Because I suppose that if I started out here in the city of Milwaukee and I traveled, I walked for three days, maybe I might um, make it to Lake Michigan by the end of it. And I was just shouting this out as cars are whizzing by me on the highway and everything. And it's freezing cold outside and I bump into nobody. How many people do you think I would save if these, this was my method that I decided to do? I'm going to walk out and, and call this out. Would I get one? Maybe. And yet somehow as he's traveling, the entire city pays attention and they hear. And their hearts are changed and they repent incredible. And again, why was the message so successful? It was successful in great part because this is the message that God gave to him. And God made all of this happen. Um, it, even the fact that Jonah received a second chance, that's all due to God's grace. And it's due to God's grace that Jonah is here. And if you want an example in the Old Testament, of Gentile people, non-Jewish people, getting to hear about a Messiah, there are not many. But there is this. Now, as I was preparing for this and reading commentaries, there was one commentary that I usually like that at this time I hated. Um, and uh, the, the commentator was talking about Jonah's preaching, and he said, you know, the words that we have, he doesn't actually mention the Messiah. He doesn't actually mention the Savior. Um, maybe they didn't even learn the true God. He just told them to repent. And they repented, but they all went to hell anyway. And I said, as I was reading, I said, that's crazy. Why would that happen? Why would God bother Jonah, go to enemy territory, go into one of their capital cities, and preach so that they would all be condemned anyway? And then I found, fortunately, Matthew um, chapter 12, where Jesus is talking about Jonah. And he says, The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. 
In other words, at judgment day, the, the people of Nineveh will stand up and condemn the current generation, which hasn't repented, which hasn't believed in the Savior. Why would they do that? Because they did. Their hearts were changed. They repented. An incredible ministry effort. Hundreds of thousands of people converted in just a few days of this guy going out and saying this message, which to him seemed terrible. He didn't even want to go in the first place. And the funny thing, I think Jonah's a really funny book. Um, I think it's funny in the same way that uh, like the Apostle Peter is funny, where one minute he's really heartfelt, loving Jesus, following him, and the next minute he's putting his foot in his mouth. Um, I think it's funny because it reminds me of me. And the crazy thing is, at the end of the book of Jonah, the prophet Jonah, the man who did all this, you know, and God was at work, but he was the one who did it. He was the one who pounded the pavement. He was the one shouting out the message until his throat got hoarse. He was the one doing it. At the end of it, he climbs um, up to a hill so he can see the whole city, and he waits for the city's destruction and he wants the city to be destroyed. That prophet who proclaimed that good message of turning hearts back to God, he wanted them to die. He didn't want them to receive the same grace that he had received. Isn't that crazy? And at the end, God says, shouldn't I care about that city? And shouldn't I care about all those people? And shouldn't I even care about the animals inside of that city? And it ends with the question, the end. And then Jonah, the prophet, is left for the rest of his life to reflect on this. And he wrote it down, I'm sure. Who else was there? It must have been him. An interesting thing happens to us. Um, I, actually, there's a couple things. One of them is... We don't necessarily want to share God's message. He, we want to share a different message, or, or we don't want to share a message at all. God said to Jonah a second time, go into the city and proclaim the message I give you. Not what you thought of in your head on the way over here, um, but I want you to go and share the message. And he did, and God worked through it because those were his words and the power is in his words anyway, and they touch people's hearts and they're changed. But I suppose there's many different words that I could have come up with besides that, and as I read it, if I was the prophet and I was hearing what God had to say, and I said, that's the message you gave me, that, that's not going to work. That's not going to affect anybody. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's it? Nineveh's a powerful city. They don't have enemies next to them. They're conquerors. And in, actually, in, in just a short while, they did go on and they conquered the Israelites. They destroyed the capital city of Samaria. They took them over. And I'm going to tell this city, if you don't turn back, your city is going to be destroyed. How's that going to work? How's that going to change anybody's mind? And how am I going to share God's word today if that's not the message, if it's something else how am I going to show up every single Sunday and open this book and read what it has to say and apply it to people today? How is this message going to change anybody's heart? How is the next message going to change anybody's heart? How is anything going to be accomplished? How is there any hope? It seems like there's so much wickedness in the world. It seems like there's so much evil. Maybe we ought to just wait and sit on a hill and wait for God to just destroy the whole thing. Like Jonah did. And that's, of course, if you're even willing to share it in the first place. Because how many of us have been given a message from God, tried to share it once or twice, said, that's not going to work. I guess I'll go home then. And yet the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He didn't learn from it, not in the moment. But could it be that people who are rebellious can be forgiven? Can it be that people who are selfish and wait for the destruction of others, can it, can it be that they could be forgiven? 
Can it be that God would grant repentance even to people like us who can be so prone to sit in the same pew and pray the same prayer and sing the same song and think we've got everything all figured out and God ought to be grateful that he has us in this building. Jonah was a prophet of God. He was a man who knew God. And yet in that moment, he didn't understand God at all because God loves people. He made him in the first place. And God loved the people of Nineveh, and God loved Jonah. And Jonah thought, I don't care about them at all. So I'm not going to do that, because I would rather see them destroyed, because they're my enemies. And yet God wanted to take their hearts and change them from being his enemies and make them his friends and make them a part of his family. And God has done that for you as he sent his son to die for you, to forgive you, to redeem you. God is all about forgiveness. And God is all about forgiving you so that your sins would be wiped clean, so that your record would be erased and God would look at you and have nothing against you. And so the word of the Lord comes to you a second time, again, now that you know that, now that you know your Savior, saying, go and proclaim the message I give you. And I don't know what that message is going to be. I know what he told Jonah. I can look at historical records and see how God used different people throughout the years. I can see how God used the Apostle John, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul. I can see how God used Martin Luther. I can see how God used past ministers who were at this church before me, and I can even find records of some of the sermons that they preached. I can talk to people who served at St. James in the past and said, here's what we did, and here's what we tried to do, and here's how God was at work. I can hear the stories of people as I visit them in their homes, saying, throughout my whole life, here's how God was at work. And I can be thankful for all that, but I know no two stories are exactly the same. And the message that God gives you is different than the message that God gives me. And the people that God has placed in your life is a little bit different than the people that he's placed in my life. But I know that he has a message for me. And I know that he wants me to serve. That's why he told me to go. And that's why he tells you to go. And that's why he told Jonah to go. Because there was something to do. And something to speak. And if you've been sitting on your hands and if you've been holding your tongue and refusing to speak, then I want to tell you that's wrong. That's a sin. We bring it to Jesus. We receive forgiveness. He brings us back in. Wouldn't it be nice if others could have the same peace that you have? Wouldn't it be nice if other people could walk around with the confidence of knowing my sins are forgiven? I don't have to worry what's going to happen if I pass away in my sleep tonight. I mean, I don't, I got to tell my wife all the passwords to stuff. And I got to find my social security card and, you know, find the car keys because I lose those all the time. But besides that, if I die, I know where I'm going. Wouldn't it be nice if others could have that too? Wouldn't it be nice if God could put people in your life and give you opportunities to reach them in ways big and small? I'm not saying this is the message we're going to preach. The same thing that Jonah said. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. He preached it because that's what God told him. God's telling you something. Please share it with people. Because God put you where you are for a reason. And I like to think, just as I see the historical record of things, and I see some, some people were very gentle and tender Um, And others were very strong and unyielding and and strong-willed so that they couldn't be deterred. I think God makes a man, God makes a woman, God makes his people for the time that they're living in. So instead of comparing yourself to Julius Caesar and General Patton and a million other people who lived and died before you, think about yourself, think about God and what he's asking you to do. Second time, 
Go and proclaim his message. Amen. Amen. Our worship continues as we join in confessing our faith together. Um, I realized we haven't used the Apostles' Creed in a while, so we'll use that this morning. You'll find that on page 163 in the front of the blue hymnal. The words are also on the screen. Please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with our prayer of the church. especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful rest. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially our members from St. James who are homebound. We pray for Jackie and Jerry Bequest, for Jerry Begalke and Carol Brandt, for Ruth Cardis, Carol Kianka and Darlene Rodriguez, and Shirley Schultz. Lord, comfort and encourage these members. Be with them, show them your presence, and bring others into their lives to care for them well. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things, in him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Now this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith to life everlasting. All of your sins are forgiven. You may live in peace. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Once again, good morning, everyone. So nice to have all of you here. Um, I've just got a couple of things to announce. Uh, there's quite a bit in this announcement section in the, in the service folder, so please take a look at that. Um, one of the things 
Um, I especially want to point out on page six, there's a little graphic about an upcoming Bible study that's starting today. Um, our adult Bible study, sorry, family Bible study, whatever we call Sunday morning Bible study, uh, just finished a look at um, the life of Jesus from Mary's perspective. Now we're starting a new study on the book of Judges that'll be here in the sanctuary um, at about 1045, I think we'll get started. Um, I know people have to get their coffee and their snacks and things, but about 1045, that'll be right here. Um, besides that, there's a number of things in the bulletin, and we are about a year out, or not, not a year out, a month out from Ash Wednesday, and about a month from today, uh, the third Sunday in January, we've got a guest preacher coming in who's going to uh, preach about missions. He's a guy who's started a mission here in the United States, a church that started with just a handful of people. Um, I think they had 10 for their first worship service, and now they're over 80 members total. He's going to help us, um, give us some ideas and perspectives on um, evangelism and missions, because that's something we've been talking about and trying to figure out what that looks like for our area. So that's the third Sunday in February. Save the date. Show up here. And um, that's all I got to say about that. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Lorenzen, one of our elders, has um, an announcement to give about your grade. Just kidding. It's not a grade. Um, it's an attendance report. It is not a grade. Uh, it's something that's for your benefit. But if you would like a sticker, I can try and find you one that you scratch it and it smells good. All right. I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> good morning, brothers and sisters. Pastor actually summed it up pretty well. Um, Eric's going to show a, a slide here for us. Um, so in your mailbox during service, there were... Uh, little elves that were busy delivering these, and um, it is your attendance, uh, worship and communion attendance summary for the last year. And the way we do this is it is December 22 through November 23. So just when when you see that, keep that in mind that it's not a calendar year, but it is a 12 month summary. And very simply, um, it just shows you the number of times that you attended worship um, over the number of available worship opportunities, including. Lenten uh, midweek services and Advent mid midweek services, um, and then also the number of times that you received the Lord's Supper um, uh, versus the number of times that were available. And just to, to emphasize, this is absolutely not at all meant as a grade, as Pastor uh, joked. Um, it is just so you're aware, and, and sometimes we just kind of um, aren't really uh, aware and paying attention to, to um, you know, how often we get to church uh, to take it to uh, take advantage of the opportunities to come together as God's family. So just to keep you aware, absolutely no judgment. Um, if you happen to notice anything that seems off, you know, a discrepancy, a question, please come see me, see one of the elders, um, and we would be, or see pastor, we would be more than happy to, to talk with you um, and, and answer any questions that you might have. But please find these in your mailboxes. Um, just wanted to show you what the, the graphic looks like. And um, Oh, and one other thing, it does not take into account um, if you're traveling. So if you happen to be on vacation or live somewhere else throughout the year and worship somewhere else at St. James, obviously we don't know that. So just know that yourself, that, that um, if, if we, we won't know if you're worshiping elsewhere. That's obviously not reflected in the report. So that's all I've got. Thank you and God bless you. <clears throat>